good afternoon, everyone. Um, just a, a little bit of background about uh, us. Um, I started life uh, as a mining engineer uh, quite a long time ago. Um, I then spent about 20 years working in the building materials industry uh, across uh, different product groups from concrete, asphalt, terrestrial uh, quarrying, and a significant exposure to marine aggregates before I joined the Crown Estate about 10 years ago now. Um, I'm delighted to be joined by um, uh, Ian, uh, Dr. Ian Selby uh, this afternoon. Ian is a director of a consultancy, Geoconcilium, uh, but has also had a significant exposure to uh, building materials and marine aggregates in particular. In fact, uh, as you reminded me um, when we spoke last, uh, we actually joined the same marine aggregates company in the same year. And I'm not going to tell you how long ago that it was. It was 1988. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> Yes. So, um, so we've got uh, a track record. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and Ian's, Ian's uh, exposure to marine aggregates includes being a uh, director or resources director for Hanson Aggregates Marine. Uh, and he also worked at the Crown State with me as head of minerals and infrastructure. So, um, so uh, one further thing the Marine Minerals Academy, uh, which Gary mentioned, uh, we're running that again in 2024. And we've just issued the, the flyer. Um, uh, uh, asking for, for nominations to be submitted uh, and Ian will be acting as program director for that again. Today we've split the uh, webinar into two uh, presentations. I'm going to talk to you first about the Crown Estate, its origins, um, our wider role and our involvement in the world of uh, marine aggregates. I'm going to give you some idea um, uh, of the um, part that they play in our society look a little bit at uh, marine regulation and licensing uh, and the management um, that we put into managing uh, extraction um, and some um, context for where we fit uh, in terms of other development and the scale of the industry. Um, if none, none of that's of particular interest to you, then I suggest you set your arm for 30 minutes and then come back when I'll be handing over to Ian, uh, who's going to take us on a, a journey into the future and provide a possible um, vision of the development of the industry. Um, and his half of the webinar is likely to be considerably more interesting than mine. So, so before I start, for, for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, an aggregate dredger is effectively a very large floating hoover. Uh, it effectively sucks aggregate from the seabed at depths of up to 50 or 60 meters, quite often over a, a screening tower into its hold. It then drains the cargo as it um, steams from the dredge site back to port, and then it discharges its cargo uh, where it's um, processed um, and or distributed um, as required. The cargo that it carries is um, technically entirely interchangeable with land-based sands and gravels, um, although shape tends to be a little rounder. Um, there are myths about use of marine aggregates in terms of chloride contents, uh, and alkali silica reaction, um, those are um, just simply that, they are myths. Um, proper management control means that uh, the product has been used in many prestigious um, uh, projects around the country and elsewhere. So the Shard, the Walkie Talkie in London, the Second Seven Crossing, uh, Wimbledon Number One Court, Tottenham and Arsenal Football Clubs. Um, more recently, Hinkley Power Station, uh, and uh, in the EU, um, the, the, the major new lock system that uh, gives entry to Amsterdam and the um, uh, uh, structural concrete in the Antwerp Ring Road. So I could go on, but I, I won't in the interest of time. So um, I'm going to start by giving you a, a short and possibly highly inaccurate history lesson. And you may be wondering why um, I'm showing a photograph of a small roundabout in East Sussex. Well, that's because according to BBC's time team, if you go back to 1066, this is the actual site of the Battle of Hastings, not the accepted uh, battle site, which is a couple of miles down the road on the left. If you give me um, some poetic license, I think I can imagine Harold's army. The uh, officers are taking tea in Yeldi Cafe on the other side of the roundabout. The other ranks are um, having a swift half in the pub on the right. Uh, and Harold, well, he's in the bookies um, uh, making a wager on the outcome of the impending skirmish. The French enter stage left in a, a, an old but venerable Citroën Picasso, um, sharpened baguettes at the ready. 
So we know that um, Harold never did get to cash in his betting slip um, and uh, Britain came under Norman rule. The point of that story is that um, uh, when William took over the crown, um, all land and by definition seabed um, came under the ownership of the crown. So um, and that sets a, a, a framework, I suppose, that uh, exists to this day. If you um, fast forward uh, about well, almost exactly 700 years, in fact, to the reign of King George III, and things are a little different. Successive kings and queens have uh, um, gifted or sold land to, uh, to fund wars or for favours um, 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 offered. Um, and George's uh, estates are significantly reduced. Um, his income has dwindled and he's uh, unable to meet his fiscal responsibilities to the nation, which includes funding the army uh, and civil government. So he's forced to do a deal with the government of the day. Um, in return for an annual income uh, for life, um, he surrendered, amongst other things, uh, his hereditary revenues from Crown lands. Uh, to Parliament, and the Crown Estate then became a reality. Uh, as a, a point of interest, he also gave up his um, income from the post office, but I wasn't going to go there, given the um, recent uh, stories about the post office. Um, if you then fast forward uh, another 200 years, um, the Crown Estate Act of 1961 uh, was passed, um, and that um, replaced all previous legislation relating to the, the Crown Estate and created the governance under which we operate today. So under the terms of the Act, the Crown Estate is an independent commercial organisation. Our role um, is to make sure that the land and property uh, that we invest in and manage are sustainably worked, developed and enjoyed to deliver uh, the best economic, social and environmental value into the long term. All profits we make are handed back to um, Treasury for the benefit of the, uh, of the state. Um, uh, and uh, as a result, we're the only business that I'm aware of that pays 100% tax. So our um, purpose is to create uh, lasting and shared prosperity for the nation. So our business includes um, assets of national importance. For example, the whole of Regent Street and about half of St. James's in London, Windsor Great Park. Um, we also uh, own many thousands of acres of rural land and we've developed and operate, um, sorry, not operate, we've developed um, a, a number of retail parks a, around the country. Um, we've also got ownership, about, ownership of about 55% of the foreshore um, uh, of England, Wales and Northern Ireland. Um, it's important to note that we don't have any involvement in Scotland anymore. That's um, managed now by the Scottish uh, government. Uh, we also own almost the entirety of the seabed, um, which is obviously where we come in, in terms of the uh, mineral extraction offshore. Um, just one point, we don't own the royal palaces, uh, so Buckingham uh, Palace um, uh, and um, Balmoral and the like. Uh, that's owned by the Royal House of Direct, which is directly um, back to the government, uh, to the monarch, sorry. So, where the water meets the um, the land and everything offshore of that is managed by the uh, marine business unit within the Crown Estate. The seabed involved is um, uh, encompasses some 270,000 square kilometres and that's about, or just over one and a half times the uh, land mass of England, Wales and Northern Ireland combined. In that area, we manage a number of uh, different activities, uh, mineral extraction being one, but also cables and pipelines, offshore wind energy, wave and tidal energy, gas storage, aquaculture, uh, carbon capture, coastal development and disposal at sea. We act as an active landlord. We're not a developer. Um, we're not an operator or a regulator, and we work in line with the grain of government policy. So um, what rights do we have and uh, what, how are they provided to us? Well, um, management of a number of offshore activities uh, vested, in, uh, vested in Grand State, partly through the ownership of the territorial seabed that came with that 1760 agreement. And that ex agreement now extends out um, to 12 miles from the coastline. The diagram you can see in front of you goes from the land on the left-hand side 
through the low water line past the territorial limit um, to either the median line, which is the boundary with another state, or the continental shelf. Outside the 12 mile limit, um, rights have been granted through various uh, acts of parliament, so the Continental Shelf Act of 1964, the Energy Acts and the Exclusive Economic Zone Order. Uh, and as a result of all of that, we're able to grant rights in respect to that range of activities that I've uh, described and, uh, as shown on the screen. There are some uh, in, um, activities that we don't have any involvement in. Um, so hydrocarbons, we don't have any responsibilities for oil and gas and coal, that's reserved back to government. Uh, and also we don't have any involvement in fishing, uh, public rights such as bathing and uh, navigation, um, leisure and of course ports and, and shipping. So in the world of um, uh, offshore minerals, the Crown Estate is the entity that has um, ownership uh, and or rights over the land and the mineral that's being worked. Um, so how is it expected to behave? It is after all a, a public uh, organisation. Well, under the Act, um, we're an estate in land only. Um, we can't operate businesses in the traditional sense, and we can only uh, manage assets in the UK. In some uh, areas, notably offshore, we have a, a monopoly interest, uh, which we have to take into account in our commercial dealings. Uh, we have a statutory responsibility to maintain and enhance the value of the estate and the assets that make up that estate. And what that means in practice is that we have to secure full market value when entering into a, a contract uh, to rent or to, to sell an asset. We also have an obligation to exhibit high standards of estate management. Um, that means that uh, the organization has sustainability running through its veins effectively. And you could say that um, given that the act was um, drafted in the 1950s, it was quite a, a forward looking piece of legislation. We do have some um, responsibilities um, in law under uh, uh, environmental consenting uh, activity because um, of our status as a competent authority. I'll, I'll touch on that in a minute. So I was going to turn now to marine regulation. Um, the Marine and Coastal Access Act of 2009, um, or MACA as it's sometimes known for short, that's the vehicle used by the UK to deliver the Habitats Directive. DEFRA is the uh, responsible government department, and it's provided an overall um, uh, planning framework through the 2011 um, uh, UK Marine Policy Statement. Um, MACA is important because it introduced for the first time a statutory licensing system offshore. Offshore activity takes place against the background of a set of uh, marine spatial plans first of those was uh, adopted in 2014, covered the east, inshore and offshore areas, um, but others have, uh, have followed and the whole coast, the whole coast is now um, managed by uh, different marine plans. Um, the responsibility of determining applications um, in a planning and environmental sense is that of the regulator. Um, and in England, that's the Marine Management Organization and in Wales, it's Natural Resources Wales. I won't talk about Scotland and Northern Ireland because um, there's no uh, mineral activity offshore. So the point I want to make on this slide is that um, it's worth noting that and um, from a European context at least, uh, the UK offshore structure is pretty unique because in the UK there's a segregation of commercial and statutory licensing responsibilities. That segregation drives different actions and behaviors. Crown Estate acts as a commercial landlord with, and has responsibility for providing commercial licenses in, in uh, respect of exploration and extraction activity. We manage licenses to ensure compliance with commercial terms. Um, uh, and we also have a, a one eye on any uh, conditions imposed through um, statutory consent. Our overriding sense of direction and governance is provided by the Act. Uh, however, um, although it's independent, it does have that one eye on um, the grain of government policy, as I said earlier. Uh, we also have a facilitating and enabling role. Uh, we have an ability to act as um, an honest broker, a trusted advisor, a bridge, if you like, between industry and government. And it has a unique constitution that encourages it to act in that way. The responsibilities of determining applications in a planning and environmental sense is, is the regulators. 
It reviews um, applications and associated environmental impact assessments, and all marine aggregate uh, applications have to be supported by an EIA. It conducts consultation with a wide range of, of bodies and takes advice from its own uh, statutory advisors uh, before issuing or perhaps refusing to issue a, um, a marine license, which is a combination of an environmental uh, and planning permit. Um, and the regulator obviously enforces um, compliance with that uh, marine license. You can't extract marine aggregates in the UK uh, without um, consent from both the regulator and the landowner, which in most cases is the Crown Estate. So I talked a little bit that we had statutory obligations. Um, we're not a regulator, but we do have um, those obligations um, under some environmental legislation. And I haven't got time to go into any detail, um, but we must make sure that we take certain things into account uh, as part of our decision-making process particularly with regard to habitat, biodiversity, uh, and any associated environmental designations. Um, so most notably, uh, we're a competent authority under the Habitats Regulations, and so we have to uh, carry out a plan level Habitats Regulations assessment process where we are um, conducting anything that constitutes a plan, such as uh, a licensing or leasing round. And that uh, effectively assesses the impact of the proposed activity on special protection areas, uh, SPAs, and special uh, areas of conservation, or SACs. So um, just going to um, move now to commercial licensing. Uh, this is a very high-level summary of the Crown Estate licensing uh, application process. We've offered commercial rights um, to extract aggregates through a competitive tender process since the 1990s. Companies have been able to bid for rights to areas across the seabed of England, uh, Wales and Northern Ireland. Our tender window tends to be open uh, for a few months uh, and is advertised um, publicly. Um, you can access the seabed um, at any time for limited exploration purposes um, by applying for a seabed survey license as well. So subject to controls on spatial footprint and any other rights already granted, we've invited applicants to tell us uh, which areas of seabed they would like to apply for. Applicants make a commercial bid um, together with a supporting business plan, uh, provide assurances over their technical and financial competence uh, and their understanding of the seabed that they are applying for. Um, bids are then assessed against a, a matrix um, that's issued with the, uh, the tender itself. If the bid is successful, it will be um, subject to the um, output of a habitats uh, regulations assessment. Um, and if uh, that doesn't um, provide any concerns, then we offer a, an expiration and option agreement, which has a six year life and allows um, applicants to, uh, to do further resource assessment and to, uh, to do environmental impact assessment work streams to apply for a marine license uh, and, to, and to get that license. Once they've got the license, they can convert their uh, expiration agreement into a production agreement, which allows um, uh, uh, production to take place for 15 years uh, with a right to renew for a further 15 years. And that 15 year term uh, is, is typical of the, um, the, the length of a marine license as well. So, um, According to um, DEFRA's marine policy statement, the UK has world-class resources um, of marine sand and gravel. Um, and I just wanted to give you an, an idea as to where they existed. Um, we've also, from a construction aggregate perspective, um, got a very mature, highly developed, um, well-regulated -reg uh, industry dealing with its um, extraction. Undoubtedly, at the forefront uh, when compared against its um, uh, global peers in terms of size, management, and sustainability. Um, a little over 10 years ago, uh, we, as the Crown State, uh, employed the British Geological Survey um, to, uh, to carry out an assessment of uh, marine uh, mineral resources using all existing data available to them at, at disposal at the time. The output of that work takes uh, the form of a, a number of reports and maps. Um, you can see 
uh, the map on the right hand side of the screen um, and those are all publicly uh, available. Um, as you can see, the, um, the resources of sand and gravel are uh, quite widely distributed um, uh, and although the screenshot doesn't show it, um, the resources are, are very, very large indeed. So um, the work has been provided to um, marine regulators to assist in the development of marine plans, uh, which um, themselves carry varying uh, levels of safeguarding for um, extraction areas, application areas, and, uh, yeah, and key resource areas. As the seabed gets busier, uh, we're working to provide a higher level of granularity in terms of our understanding of the, the resource model um, for marine aggregates. And um, we've completed um, geophysical and geotechnical surveys offshore uh, recently in the RSC, the Southern North Sea and the eastern part of the English Channel. Uh, we're planning more. In fact, we've, um, we're just in the process of defining uh, the scope, the technical scope for uh, our next uh, phase of surveys. Offshore um, development is growing fast. Um, the timeline you can see um, shows the growth of activity from the 1960s until today. Um, note in particular the, um, the growth or the pace of growth since um, 2010, uh, which we forecast to continue and perhaps to accelerate. Um, that means that we have a, a responsibility um, to ensure that um, seabed optimization fits with the aspirations of UK PLC. Uh, we need to make sure that we make space for the diverse system of activities uh, that the sea and the seabed supports. And this has never been uh, more important than it will be in the coming decades. Um, we need a holistic approach um, to meet the needs of the disparate markets, including uh, the marine aggregate market, uh, and we need to make sure that the activities of today don't compromise the ability of, uh, of future generations to live in and enjoy the rich environment that it represents. Effective governance today is part of that future proposition, and that's why we have generated what we call our whole seabed program, uh, which is firmly targeted to address uh, those future optimization issues. So I just want to turn now to a bit of um, governance in the terms of, in, in sense of management and control. Every uh, marine aggregate dredger operating in the UK um, has had an electronic monitoring system installed since 1993. The latest iteration is owned and was developed by the Crown Estate and was rolled out across the fleet in 2018. It's effectively a, a black box or a tachograph, if you like, for the dredging industry it monitors where the ship is and also whether or not it's dredging at any time and it scavenges data from the vessel uh, every 10 seconds. We operate it uh, obviously for um, commercial compliance, but we also operate it on behalf of the regulator. It is used as an enforcement tool, but it also provides data that help um, support the industry's sustainability credentials. The data um, delivered by the EMS system is used to provide the reporting requirements of what we call the Area Involved Initiative with respect to the um, intensity of dredging. And the Area Involved Initiative was um, uh, instigated jointly by the industry and the Crown Estate back in 1999. It requires that any seabed that no longer contains viable sand and gravel resources is surrendered. Um, and uh, it also requires uh, the annual uh, analysis and uh, reporting of um, dredging intensity. There's also other self-imposed governance that's been developed jointly by the industry and the Crown Estate. I, meant, I mentioned that we act as a, a bridge between industry and government, and we've worked closely with the industry to develop initiatives that provide the sector uh, with a more sustainable and durable future. These initiatives uh, and protocols help enhance efficiency, and resilience, and they help de demonstrate innovation and best practice. So apart from the area involved initiative, other examples are the uh, Marine Aggregates Heritage Protocol, uh, development of best practice for licensing, environmental uh, assessment, uh, management methods, etc. 
uh, development of coastal impact assessment guidance, um, and innovation as well uh, in projects like the Regional Seabed Monitoring Programme, which is aimed at providing a more efficient and robust uh, way of assessing impact on dredging, uh, of dredging on benthic communities. And much of the work that we do with the industry is, is um, at a regional level rather than a, a, a project level, which provides a, a more robust uh, regulatory framework. Uh, I think these uh, initiatives have provided the industry with a very strong re reputation amongst stakeholders, advisors and regulators, uh, and I think still set a, a benchmark for other industries to follow. So I'm just going to pick on one of the uh, protocols. Since uh, 2005, I think it was, the industry has been operating a heritage protocol. Uh, that's now jointly funded by the Crown Estate and Industry, and it's managed by uh, a company called Wessex Archaeology. Uh, any item that is, is found in a cargo can be sent to Wessex for uh, assessment. Um, that could be anything from 20th century crockery that's been thrown overboard to military records like, uh, uh, sorry, relics like aircraft parts and cannonballs um, to prehistoric remains like uh, woolly mammoth remains uh, um, and prehistoric hand axes uh, from the time when obviously the, the seabed uh, was much lower uh, and was land. Uh, Wessex will review the, the find, uh, investigate and provide a, a written report on, um, on what, it, uh, what the article is. Uh, we have a, a magazine which is uh, regularly issued with a summary of, of what's been found. The programme also has an educational component um, with wharf and ship staff being um, trained in what to look for. Uh, and um, there's also a, a competition um, for the, the best find and the, uh, the most professional attitude uh, by a, a wharf or a, a ship. Uh, and the, the, the crews and the wharf operating staff take, uh, take this quite seriously and I think are a credit to, to the industry. As a result of the protocol we have, um, I think provided society with quite um, a significant amount of insight into prehistoric life in, in areas where sea used to be land, such as the uh, North Sea and Doggerland, for example. So you can find um, more detail as to what license has have been consented and those which are going through the application stage through our open data portal, which you can access through our website. The image on the right uh, shows where all marine um, mineral activity is currently taking place. The brown shapes are marine aggregate licenses, the solid ones are uh, active extraction areas and the hollow ones, I know it's a bit difficult to see uh, on the screen, but the hollow ones are application areas. The big yellow block up on the northeast coast, um, that is um, two um, deep underground potash mines, uh, Bulby, which has been operating for the last uh, 50 years, and Woodsmith. Uh, which is a multi-billion pound uh, project which is still under development by Anglo-American and they expect to start mining um, in roughly 2027. And just finally, the smaller shapes adjacent to the Cornish coast are lithium exp exploration licenses which we granted about three years ago. So this slide shows some statistics relating to the UK um, marine minerals um, industry and the figures I want to draw your attention to are on the top line. There are currently 66 uh, marine aggregate licenses, uh, extraction licenses, that is, spread uh, around the coast of England and Wales. Uh, as I said before, no extraction taking place in Scotland or, or Northern Ireland. The licenses occupy uh, around 1,100 square kilometres. Um, um, that figure is what's licensed, but uh, the uh, 23rd uh, Area Involved Initiative uh, report will tell, tell you that the actual area, area that was extracted, um, the dredging uh, was on a, just over 100 square kilometres and 90% of dredging took place in less than 50 square kilometres. And that very much fits in accordance with the uh, initiative to reduce the area impacted by dredging at any given time. There's an annual capacity of uh, about 40 million tonnes. There's more coming through our last um, tender round. Um, uh, and in 2021, about 20 and a half million tonnes was extracted. Now, you might think that that gives a considerable ex excess of capacity, 
Uh, but the reality is that uh, things are just a, a little different. Um, keeping that market fed involves cooking a, a complicated recipe with a, a large range of ingredients. And the licenses represent the, the store cupboard in which those ingredients are stored. Total reserves, consented reserves uh, of marine aggregate stand at around 350 million tonnes. You can learn more about these stats from our landing statistics and our annual review report, which are both available uh, on our website. Um, we have been um, uh, logging detailed records of extraction um, since the 1950s, although in reality, extraction does go back beyond that. Um, since the 1950s, over a billion tonnes has been extracted uh, and the industry has been operating at broadly its current scale uh, for, the, for the last um, 50 years, uh, since the 1970s, dominated by demand um, from, from London. Typically, annual extraction has been at around 20 million tonnes in recent years, with um, circa 14 million tonnes of that being used for um, UK construction. About four and a half million tonnes is exported, mainly to Belgium and, and Holland. Um, and the, uh, the, the balance is used in project work, so um, reclamation uh, and coastal defence. I'll come to that in just a second. So uh, from figures produced by the Mineral Products Association, in 2021, marine aggregates represented around 7% of uh, UK primary construction uh, aggregate demand uh, and about 23% of uh, sand and gravel demand. Um, but in some markets, the, the role of marine aggregates um, is, is stronger. They provide a significantly higher proportion of supply. For example, in London, 50% of primary aggregate demand uh, is supplied by marine aggregates. Uh, and in Wales, um, over 80%, probably closer to 90% of the sand uh, used uh, is uh, comes from the sea. Again, more information is available, including the chart you can see on the right hand side in our annual review document, all available through our website. So um, what makes marine aggregate supplies work? Well, firstly, um, bulk, I suppose, uh, one large um, dredger can carry the same as over 90 rail wagons uh, and over 420 um, tonne tippers. Um, secondly, I think the ability to deliver directly into the center of large um, conurbations. Two of the largest marine aggregate walls in the UK um, uh, are located just um, four miles from the Tower of London. So th that enhances the uh, efficiency of supply logistics to the core construction market in those um, city centers, um, noting that some 70% of marine aggregate ends up uh, going into the production of ready mixed concrete. And I guess thirdly, um, the potential for those extremely large resources, which are capable of providing large tonnages um, for uh, a very long time into the future. So um, this is my last slide before I hand over to Ian. Um, uh, I expect that the people on this call are quite familiar uh, with um, aggregate use in uh, construction. But marine aggregates also pay um, also has played a significant role uh, in uh, um, coastal adaptation um, projects. So, for reclamation activities, for example, for developments of, of ports at uh, uh, Felixstowe, for example, London Gateway, uh, Liverpool Two Container Terminal, uh, Greenport Hull. So, where land was reclaimed, reclaimed using uh, marine aggregates. Um, and the next project, I think, will be uh, the third phase of the Dover reclamation, uh, um, sorry, the Dover regeneration project where another million um, tons will be, um, another million cubic meters, I think, will be placed um, later this year. It's also had a, a significant role um, in coastal defense. Um, roughly 40 million tons has been delivered to uh, beach replenishment projects in the last 25 years. Um, it plays a, a unique uh, role in, in this particular market. Uh, you might remember the Backton to Walcott uh, sandscaping scheme that hit the uh, national headlights, uh, headlines back in um, 2019 um, in, uh, off the coast of Norfolk, or on the coast of Norfolk, I should say. That scheme 
in represents um, innovation in the UK and follows the Dutch concept of, of working with nature. The Bacton gas terminal um, supports and imports around one third of um, Britain's gas requirements. Uh, there was a fundamental uh, need to protect the, the terminal from the sea. The, the coastline had receded uh, about 100 metres and various options were um, considered. Uh, to cut a, a very long story short, the terminal operators, which is Shell and Paranco, along with the council, North Norfolk District Council and the Environment Agency, came together and the scheme, uh, sandscaping scheme was, was adopted. Um, this provides a, a very high level of defence for the terminal uh, with a design life of uh, about 20 years, but it also provides uh, the villages down drift of the terminal um, with um, uh, some defence as well, providing them with time to consider uh, options for long-term uh, resilience. The Crown State was involved um, uh, at the, in the scheme from its inception uh, and provided funding, uh, research, feasibility studies uh, and brought um, the various stakeholders together. Uh, in fact, Ian was very heavily involved in that scheme when he was with, with us. A total of three, uh, over 3 million tonnes, 3.2 million tonnes were placed using uh, the HAM 318. That's a, the dredger you can see uh, sitting on the horizon on the right hand side of the picture. Uh, she has a hold capacity of 35,000 cubic metres, so in theory she can, um, she can carry 50,000 tonnes, um, although she was short-loading because of um, uh, seabed depth. Um, she um, delivered an average of 90,000 tonnes per day. Um, that's, uh, I think, a tipper every 20 seconds, uh, directly onto the beach uh, where it was uh, uh, through a, a, float, a, a sinking pipeline which came from the ship, it was pumped out under the seabed and, and came out onto the beach uh, and avoided about 150,000 lorry movements in, uh, in the process. So that's um, all I wanted to say. I'm going to hand over to Ian now, um, who's going to talk to you about the future. Thanks, Nick. Um, <clears throat> so just taking stock um, and thinking of my my contribution to this uh, this presentation is thinking a little bit about the future because you might think um, you might think uh, this this business is well established. You might think it it's optimized. You might think the future is is uh, is clear. But um, we tend to think not actually. We think there's a lot of opportunity to develop this business uh, in 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 a number of ways and in this in this little uh supporting um conversation i think to nick's so nick has described very much his long history this position we have where our position in the market this this is i'm going to try to talk about uh, the future in terms of resources the future in terms of production and the future in terms of processing just for to whet your appetites really you know, about our about our current thinking so firstly um as nick has mentioned fantastic resources there's the really serious resources offshore um the industry is mature uh, and it's very professional and well respected and highly regulated so that's a very that's a very established thing vessels you may think are are um are sort of a fixed a fixed part of the business i'm not so sure they are because there's been so much change so just as you see changes in all sorts of uh, vehicle technology ships have changed significantly as well and will change these ships have long lifespans so 25 years or so so uh, when you when your fleet is becoming uh, at the end of its life then there's a significant upgrade so we're at that stage right now so there's going to be a lot of change around ships the wharfs the wharfs are based on inherited architecture post-war largely inherited off architecture shipping isn't done like that anymore so we're thinking about okay how could that change um, and then the other aspect are markets which largely are established, but the, 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 there can be really a, a real shift in markets as well. So um, let's go and explore this a little bit more. Um, that's to say also that there aren't challenges. Is As with any business, any business sector, there's a number of challenges around um, around the opportunity let's say uh, and the and the pace of change and those um those barriers are we're conscious of those barriers and we've been i think working on those barriers 
one of the really uh, real advantages of this sector is single landlord, the Crown Estate, because the landlord can work in conjunction in partnership with the developer, with the operator. And so that's a real advantage. It has this overview of the whole business from the resources through to uh, processing. And it can intervene in various ways. So there's a real opportunity around that space as well. So in terms of resources, there, there are high barriers to entry because, for example, not many people know about marine aggregates. That's a very simple, simple statement. Um, the industry, it, it tends to be expensive uh, and not many people in industry know about the the marine sector either. You know, it's a, it's a land dominated business. So there's some element there to think about. Um, wharfs, uh, space on our riversides is very competitive at the moment. We like to live there now. So, OK, where would where would where does this industry go? Um, and then the other the other element is around markets, as I said. So there's 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 a well-developed markets. How do you introduce how do you introduce marine aggregates into the supply in, in, a, in a developed way? So the question is, is this still competitive? I think. Uh, can the industry move with the times? Can it adapt? Um, this is a carbon intensive business like. Like many of many natural resource extractives. Um, and so there's a, there's, a, there's a challenge to deal with there. There's a challenge to deal with company structures. There's chance, challenges around long term investment. So um, that's not to say um, th there is not real opportunity in this in this sector. So let, let's talk about, first of all, minerals um, and mineral resource demand. Um, how do you how do you try to understand that? Well, you can do these things called scenarios. Basically, you create a set of future worlds that you think the, the, the country, that future world would could be in. And then you can map demand and uh, you can map resources use against that. Um, you know uh, better than, than I largely probably around the pressures on land-based development. Um, that's not to say there aren't pressures on offshore development as well, but they're, they're not going away and they're not getting smaller. Uh, and so, you know, with the population increases just been announced a couple of days ago, six million over the next six million million more people over the next decade or so. So, you know, these pressures are increasing and important. So we need to think about the context of our mineral supply strategy. And one thing that has um, we have found about that, I think, is is um, is largely or largely the evidence says, OK, we're going to need more marine aggregates. That, that, that's that's the underlying principle that we can we can adopt. One of those one of those aspects Nick talked about was Bacton. So that's Bacton gas station on the left. Before that recharge went in, uh, the pipes were poking out of the cliff, the gas pipes. So um, coastal erosion, uh, climate change, and coastal erosion is a fact of life. We choose as a society and economy to defend that or not. The way we defend it is through uh, marine sands and gravels because the volumes and the scale required is that sort of, um, uh, the numbers from a land-based supply just won't, it isn't feasible. Um, <clears throat> we also want to make new ports. So this is Thames Gateway. This is a, re a, 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 a reclamation in, in on the north side of the Thames. Um, you can see that's pushed out of the city and, and a new port has been built. And that's because it's a container terminal that you couldn't fit this in London or the London waters now. So basically, ports are moving out, becoming larger. The way you make them is through reclamation. You need large volumes of sand and gravel to do that. So we can see that the lot of our, some of our basic infrastructure is underpinned um, by uh, marine sands and gravels in that context. Um, we also believe that construction aggregate volume will grow as well. The, the scenarios I was talking about uh, have been run by uh, Mineral Products Association. You can basically try to understand the, the few, you forecast the future volume, then you, okay, how are we going to, then you decide how, okay, how are we going to supply that volume? Um, you need to do it through thinking about your various supply options, and that includes fresh rock, includes marine, includes land-based sand and gravels. Okay. What do we do to satisfy that demand? We need to keep the supply flowing. Uh, and inevitably, we believe there's a, going to be a larger demand for marine resources. So that's the backdrop. 
in terms of resource. The backdrop in terms of resources, we're going to need it for adaptation. We're going to need marine science and gravity for adaptation. We're going to need marine science for reclamation, changing our ports and our facilities. And we're going to need more marine science and gravity for our um, construction aggregate supply. Um, the response Nick mentioned is for the Crown Estate to try to understand those aggregates, uh, those aggregate resources uh, more. Uh, surveys are underway, as Nick mentioned, that they're important for two things. They're important to understand the aggregate resource, but also the, the rest of the seabed that can be used for other things. So it's like a safeguarding exercise as well, of understanding the volumes available and the, the creation of a high resolution resource inventory. This is something that only can happen under a single landlord. This doesn't happen on land. There's no, there's no comparison. So Nick's interest is the entire seabed, the entire resource. So his interest is to understand that picture and, and safeguard it and make it available to the market in an attractive way. So the way to do that is survey offshore. Um, and there's a project um, underway that's probably got a few more years to go. The surveying offshore takes time and effort. Uh, and But building this bigger picture and understanding of our national asset. And that's one thing I think it is worth mentioning as well. The, the seabed, these resources are a national asset and should be treated as such. Gotcha. So that's the objective. It's called key resource areas. Um, there's, I think it's fair to say there's, there's less understood in a general sense uh, offshore than than onshore. So this, this picture is sort of basic, uh, basic understand, developing basic understanding. But once the licenses are developed, I think it's, it's comparable, actually. The understanding of the resource offshore is very similar and worked to a degree of accuracies of metres, not tens of metres or hundreds of metres, the same way as it is on land. So you don't go away with the idea that this is, a, this is an imprecise business. It's very precise business. The positioning offshore is sub-metre. We position those ships less than we know where those ships are and the drag heads associated with those ships um, to one metre or less. So let's think a little bit about future production. Um, basically, um, these ships are well evolved, but um, they're not optimised for current conditions. So we're thinking about uh, how we make these ships more efficient. Uh, and the, the, the progress in um, efficiency and design of dredges, you know, mirrors is comparable to that of cars. You know, you think of you think of cars of 30 and 40 years ago compared to cars of now, you know, the change. Well, ships have gone through similar sorts of change. It's all around uh, design. It's around engines. It's around screening, unloading, all about uh, an automation. So it's all about the opportunity to, to um, optimise vessels. And it's, it's a very active consideration. This is what a vessel does. So it unloads, it sails, it dredged, it sails, it unloads. It just does that all the time. Uh, dredging cycles, maybe 24, 36 hours, maybe even longer. But basically what you want to try to do is minimise the time of everything as a total, but also um, minimise the time of particular activities, dredging, you make them efficient when they transit and then make them efficient when they're unloading. And it's not only the way... The, the, the scale of them, but it's the way they work. So it's also about the propulsion systems, but also the scale. Dredges have got much bigger and are going to get much bigger into the future. Um, one development that really hasn't landed yet, but is about to, I think, and is autonomy. So the top graph is a, is a person. <laughs> the bottom graph is a much more controlled computer. And so what that means is that we think we're going to see ships operating autonomy, autonomously or the production uh, of on ships is going to come in. You can see the loading time is reduced, which I was talking about, that dredging time. Uh, and you can see the fuel consumed is produced. So there's real incentives to make it happen. Um, so we're going to see autonomy enter our business, I would have thought, within the next few years, to more or less extent. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean they're self-driving in the sense when they're in transit, but certainly this is this is management of production. So this is management of pumps and systems, uh, a production of sand and gravel from the seabed. 
So, um, uh, and that's all monitored now anyhow. So it's just actually bolting on the autonomy, uh, the control systems on top. Uh, that's something that's going to happen. Uh, the decarbonisation story is is really significant. Um, obviously, these are large uh, large diesel engines. Normally, propel uh, are the propulsion systems. It's moving very quickly into considering things like hydrogen or fuel cells, uh, mixes of propulsion systems um, that, and also hookups when the, the the vessel's alongside. So, a lot of development around. Um, uh, zero emission dredging. That's moving very quickly. The technology is just like in any sort of propulsion or uh, transport system. Design. Uh, we didn't used to be able to model hulls like this, so they model hulls using uh, computer flow dynamics that, that, that make the hulls much more efficient. Uh, so you basically use less energy to get through the water. All that design technology is now, I think actually largely the, the hull forms have been evolved and I haven't got a long way to go, have they? They're very efficient. Uh, I suspect so, yeah. Yeah. So the future it could be really interesting, though. So how about this, to be really wild? Um, there's, there's talk of energy islands offshore. You may have heard of them. So basically, these hubs where energy offshore meets uh, and is uh, shared between nations. So essentially, energy comes in from various sources and, and is shared out along uh, cables interconnectors with nations so demand fluctuation can be can be managed at that point um, but you could also do the same with mineral uh, production so you could perhaps supply those sites process those sites and barge out from those sites to some sort of just a, a war facility uh, in an inner city or up a river rather than have the processing on on the on the river so perhaps we're going to see offshoring offshoring of this sort of um, this sort of processing and production and notice the ship is also autonomous in that so um, this is a really uh, out there um, I suppose future but the thinking is not too far away around that space now and then we think about uh, uh, wharfs we have uh, the post-war architecture lots of small wharfs you know what it used to be like on rivers, there's lots of small wharfage, um, and there was small ships associated. We can see this upscaling that's occurred in in this sector. Um, we've moved a little bit up the river to, um, uh, and perhaps you can look at London. You could look at uh, near the O2. There's a couple of big wharfs in there in Greenwich. Um, they're a million tons plus wharfs a year, but we think the next phase is to move further out the river and. Um, and build even larger facilities that that, um, that are going to take really really significant volumes of supply, um, uh, and the the concentration of processing will occur in those hub wall facilities. We are seeing that happen. We are seeing that happen around uh, the coast. So that's happening. That's underway now as well. Um, but sites are constraints. So there's something to think about actually how we do that. Uh, and the other way we can uh, think about uh, production efficiencies through, through fleet optimization. We used to have lots of smaller ships. Essentially, now we are modeling uh, larger ships and less of them. And we need less of them because they're traveling to hub wharfs that are further out, uh, are further out on the river. So they're not spending their time transiting. They become much more efficient production machines. Their, uh, their, their role is production, not transit. And so that what that can impact on is um, really impact around uh, capital investment and the number of vessels you need. And then you save, obviously, on fixed costs and variable costs when you're operating. Uh, we think we can just just modeling it in a very simple way. We think we can look at basically a 50 percent uh, cost reduction on dredging by optimizing that sort of uh, production. Um, there's also another another mechanism or another method that's that's emerging around um, opportunities about processing, and that's offshore transfer. So you can dredge. It's like it's almost like the island, but um, the energy island I, I showed you before. But this base is putting it into a barge, so you can bring the um, bring the barges alongside the vessel that, that can then. Sh 
transfer the, the sand and gravel offshore and take that into the wharf or small processing facility or concrete production facility up the river. So barge, basically barges, use of barges becomes much more um, uh, prevalent around UK. We don't use barges much in our waters. This in contrast to uh, the near continent, Holland and Belgium, if you've ever been there, sand and gravel's always transported on barges up the rivers and the canal. So it's thinking about actually using some of their thinking and technology. Oh. And this is, um, I suppose, the, the, a summary of that sort of idea where you can, there are options about how we uh, process, pro produce and then process offshore and then transport onshore to the various uh, various facilities. So um, it may seem, it may seem that um, this is a, an old, mature, established business where practices are um, embedded deeply. We actually think exactly the opposite. We think it's um, it's ripe for evolution and optimization and changes in efficiency. And um, given the backdrop of this national, basically this national need going forward, the, the, it's sort of all to play for. I think, isn't it? It's it's a there's real opportunity in the sector. Um, we think our job now is to try to deliver that opportunity. Yeah, acting as a bridge. Yeah. So, in summary, so there is growth in demand forecast. The resource opportunity is not constraining, really. Um, there's opportunity in processing and production innovation. We can make it more efficient and we can decarbonize. So, um, I suppose what's not to like? <laughs> what's not like? What to like about that? That's it. Okay. Thanks, Ian. Thank you very much, guys. Um, really, really interesting stuff. Um, it's it's um, it's a super interesting um, um, industry and what's part of our industry, but um, it's great to get your insight into it. So I'll open it up to the room uh, for any questions. Um, feel free to shout out on mute or um, stick it in the chat box. Compile people is probably thinking about one. Uh, just um, you mentioned, Dean, about uh, you feel like the industry is ripe for optimization. Who do you think is going to drive that? Is is it the Crown Estate industry or or a bit of a mixture of everyone? I suppose first. I'll probably uh, I'll take that one first. Um, I think um, so. What we what we can do, um, obviously, we're, we're open to discussion with with industry. We can look at uh, concepts. We can look at feasibility, um, and uh, we, we as an organisation, have the ability to invest. Um, so potentially to invest in in hub walls, for example. Um, I think to to some extent, um, once we get to a point where we understand what the options are and and, and the economics, then uh, we we have to then uh, wait for industry to to, to join us. Uh, industry may al already be looking at things like this themselves, in which case we're definitely open for a discussion to see uh, who, who can do what to, to, to um, uh, take things forward. I, and, and from my point of view, I think yeah, it's, it's opportunity for the sector mm. as well. So you've got uh, a partner landlord, mm -hmm. uh, you've got that, that, if you like, constellation of opportunity. Um, you know, industry step up here. It's there's place to, there's opportunity in this space. Let's uh, let's take advantage of that. Yeah. We already are beginning to to talk to to organisations about the the, the 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 options, the feasibility, um, and we're intending to to develop that work over the next, um, um, I guess, couple of years. Mm, watch this space. I like it. <laughs> um, any other questions from anyone? Andrew has just unmuted himself. Oh, 
still going. No. Might be having IT issues. Um, it's part of the tendering process, Nick. Um, did you see more people, uh, industry coming forward tendering for licenses than you have in the past? Um, yeah, we've uh, so we our, our latest tender round uh, was launched in twenty twenty one. The habitats regulations assessment process is just completing now, uh, and yes, we did have. Um, uh, more interest in that tender round than we've had in any previous ones and the one before that was busier than the one before that so there is a sense of direction here um, and yes we see um, new uh, new entrants um, uh, circling around the industry and putting their, their hat in the ring um, so um, so the answer is yes I think oh great I've just got a question in the chat box uh, if one of you guys want to pick that up from Ellie, thanks for your question, Ellie. Should I? Yeah. So yeah. Um, so yeah. Uh, I don't know what you found, what you thought, Ellie, but we can have a conversation. Um, El Eli, sorry, Eli. Um, uh, I. So there's two streams going on here. There's optimization of, if you like, conventional technologies. And if you, you'll know about shipping, um, shipping is um, a particular challenge. And there's, uh, there's various thoughts about shipping. Nearshore shipping potentially can run on batteries uh, because it's chargeable coming back in yeah. every, every, um, every day. Once you start getting longer timescales offshore and, and more energy intensive business, then um, it's going to be uh, you, you have to go to uh, other sorts of fueling or mm. hybrid systems. Yeah. And once you use hybrid systems, you take weight on. And then yeah. when you take weight on, you become less efficient because you're not getting weight from the cargo. Yeah. It's weight in the propulsion systems. It's... So um, we, we think there's going to be an overlap period the the ships at the moment are still um i think in and the, these are you'll be aware that the the ship the slides i were using from ihc they are the world's leading manufacturer of dredges mm -hmm. um and so their ship they they are thinking at the moment they are they are uncommitted on exactly what they think they want is going to be the future they don't yeah. know and so that but they they do think, you know, within 10, 10 years, maybe a bit more, that there's going to be decarbonized mm. options available. I, I think it's also the, um, so some companies are, are looking at methanol, some people are uh, companies are looking at LNG, some are looking at um, yeah. uh, hydrogen. Um, but it is, it is a global shipping issue. It's not just one for the dredging industry to resolve. So technology is driving in that direction. Whether there's a, a one size fits all solution yes, also remains to be seen because it's not just the technology, it's the supply chain. So yeah. if you want to use ammonia um, in in the UK for ships, then you can do, but I think there's, I think I'm right in saying there's only one place to get yeah. uh, to, to bunker the ship at the moment. <laughs> mm. So we've got those issues to, to resolve. So it's, it's bigger than just dredging, I think is the answer. What did you yeah. say? What did you say then? Yes. Yeah. I think I was quite pessimistic in my conclusion. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, but I think that there is in the shipping sector itself, and I don't know if you if you if you referenced uh, IHC in your in your study in your review, but um, they I think they would say that they think optimistically. Yeah. You may I, think it's there. There's definitely yeah. with the hybrid technology, I can see that coming in. Yeah. Medium to long term. Um, I think the main point that I was looking at was that a lot of the, the if, a lot of the improvements in efficiency would come from reducing the transition times. Um, Transit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Between yeah. In bigger loads, increased um, tons per trip, um, because it's well, really. Yeah, but you can use things like barges as well, Eli. So, yeah, you know, you know, then you then you actually. You, you hugely improve the carbon performance when you barge. Mm. So there's, it's just not about the ship. It's about the wharves. Yeah, it's not something that I, 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 I thought about in um, when I was looking at it um, okay. as a potential. But that, that that was quite interesting when you mentioned that. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah.
the other thing was um that I was just wondering like because I had to kind of estimate based on think things like um the travel times and the, the tons per trip and um, was how much can do you think a dredger can actually the average dredger at the moment how much could that supply at like kind of maximum capacity in a year uh, we get depends on the on the size of the ship clearly but um yeah uh, if you you look at the, the fleet at the moment um typical uh, workhorses around 5,000 tonnes capacity, but we're seeing some bigger ships coming yeah. through and there may well be thinking within companies to um, to, to, to move that trend forward. Um, if you, uh, I, I would say that uh, uh, the average cycle time for a ship is between 24 and 36 hours, yeah. I'd, I'd guess. Um, so you can, you know, divide 365 days by one to one and a half, multiply it by 10,000, then you've got to allow some downtime and some availability because obviously yeah. these ships can't dredge in all conditions. The weather does come into yeah. into play. Um, so, um, so, but yeah, I would have, I would have thought uh, a million and a half to two million, million tons yeah. um, all right, would be okay. um, achievable. Two million uh, tons. And yeah. certainly the, 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 even some of the older ships, the 5,000 ton ships uh, are doing a million tons a year and yeah. right. have been, through their lives. Okay, that's interesting. Okay. So great. And I apologize, Ela, for getting your name wrong. Maybe my wife is right. Maybe I should pick uh, them. No worries. <laughs> um Andrew's put a, a question in the chat box uh, if um you guys could yeah. bring that up. Um thanks Andrew. Um I think uh, it's a good question. Um so you, you saw the slide I put on about uh, the increasing um, activity at sea. Um, a lot of that is around renewables and net zero um, with offshore wind farms. Um, a lot of it's going to be to do with cables, not just um, telecoms cables, although that's uh, an increasing market, but also power cables. Uh, what are we going to do about uh, our, our grid? Can we can we rely on the, the radial system of getting power from um, from offshore wind farms ashore, or do we need something like a grid, an offshore grid system? Um, I, I, all of those issues mean that uh, the regulator has got more work. Um, the uh, statutory nature conservation bodies like JNCC, Natural England, they've also got more work. Um, so there is there is an issue in terms of the um, the, the, the skills uh, and the resources. Um, within our business, but also within uh, the regulators and the uh, and, and those statutory bodies. Uh, and certainly, I think they're under under pressure at the moment, and it's difficult for them to uh, to keep um, the ideal level of resource um, optimised. Um, so I think, uh, I mean, as a, as a country, we, we have to make sure that we have a, a system uh, which um, allows um, consenting to, to happen that um, at the sort of um, timeline that that, that um, meets the needs of of, of the nation, um, of course, uh, things like offshore wind farms tend to go through the PINs system anyway. They have a development consent order rather than the standard um, marine licensing process that a lot of activities go through. But I agree, Andrew. It is a concern, um, and it, you, I think, have. Um, more exposure to to those constraints in some ways than, than we do, given uh, given what you do uh, for a living. Um, I if Andrew wants to come back on that, does he? Or Andrew, yeah, sorry. We go. <laughs> go ahead. Yeah. Over to you, Simon. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, uh, Ian and Nick, for the presentation. I had a um, a fairly minor involvement in one of my previous lives with marine aggregates. Um, so thanks. I'm a lot less ignorant than I was in over the last hour or so. Um, I suppose the first comment is I'm surprised it seems to have taken, sorry, my dog's a bit keen as well. Um, mm -hmm. My um, uh, surprise it's taken, so, seems to have taken so long to get to a point where you're looking at um, effectively an offshore platform um, serviced by barges. That seems to be quite a instinctively a good model to me. Um, and, and sort of on, on related point, there's a you, one of your later slides, Ian. You showed um, the 
various scenarios with the Hanson ships. I think two scenarios with a with a hub somewhere probably in the southern side of the Thames estuary. I have yeah. to guess where that might be. Um, but does that introduce a lot of double handling costs and complications, or does the scale of dredging mean that it's not such a concern as it is for onshore aggregate production? I, okay, to take your second question first, yes, um, it's around um, that, that double handling, uh, um, the benefits you achieve in efficiencies through the, the wharf and the volumes there, like we are talking like multi-million ton um, yeah. processing facilities. Um, the benefits are out, outweigh the, the double handling in our uh, opinion, the, the, you know, the, 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 the penalty around double handling. But we also consider we need to make those sites as efficient as possible, given that context. It, it's sort of understood. Your, your point is valid in that sense. Um, the, and the, the, offshore, the offshore processing idea has been in and out of the sector for a long time, hasn't it? There's been, um, there's been various... Um, there was a ship called the Flamingo back was, in the 1980s. There was, yes, there was. And um, it's been... Um, uh, so it's subject to a number of uh, restrictions, though. So, um, so, and that's mainly around just-in-time type, because you, the, the volume is volume-sensitive. The ship has to arrive there at the right time. Barges have to arrive there at the right time. OK, you, you then have a facility that does that move or is that anchored? Then it comes with its own permitting um, uh, restrictions and operational restrictions. Operating offshore isn't always as um, manageable, let's say, as as onshore operations. You know, you're given states of the sea and the wind and all the things. So then, then those production impacts through the through the productivity of the whole cycle. So, um, and then coupled with that, obviously, there's the sunk investment in all the wharf assets. So it, it just hasn't happened. But I think. Um, I think it's on the cards. I think that's fair to say. We're, we're, when we're reconsidering the whole configuration of the sector, then it's back in play. Right. Well, it seems to have a, a, a larger number of smaller barges servicing an offshore production facilities probably means that there's more wharfage available to be used. Smaller wharfage, that, yeah. yeah, that doesn't suit a, a major hub wharf. Um, yeah. But I think... Uh, uh, if you're going to you utilize a hub wharf and we have seen a, a couple of them develop um uh, tarmac has has got uh, effectively something at tilbury um breck group have developed something at new haven um they have to be intermodal so they um they have to have rail potential uh, possibly um, barge potential um or as you say you you take something from that offshore processing plant uh, and, and move it further inland where you can use shallower water and smaller stocking areas that uh, um, that make that make thing work. Yeah, thank you. But I think it's, it, these are concepts at the moment. There's still a long way to go to to understand the the environmental consenting of a, an offshore platform uh, and and the economics vis-a-vis -vis, uh, other um, solutions that uh, will be available to industry banks. Yeah, so it's, it's a brave a brave operator that will invest that sort of money on a yeah, an untried yeah. um, system. Uh, absolutely. So we, we, yeah. So we we're, we're at a relatively early stage, um, but we need to we need. I think we need to understand whether it's even something that uh, um, could work um, uh, before we uh, before we discount it or before we promote it too strongly. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any further questions from the group? No. Okay. So, um, well, Ian and Nick, thank you very, very much for uh for the presentations. As Paul said in the chat, uh, a really interesting presentation, and that's what, certainly what I found last year. So, I really thank you guys for coming and for the group for joining our event as well. Um, it, it, the numbers is uh, really encouraging for the year. So, um, enjoy the rest of the day and the weekends, and and we'll speak to everyone soon. Thanks for inviting us. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.